And Adam, this is a hot ticket this weekend in Keenan Stadium. It's hot. Completely sold out down to the very last seat. So you might have to fan at SeatGeek. Yeah. That's the only official place to be sure you're getting the right kind of tickets. So let's talk about it. Carolina and Miami coming up in Keenan Stadium. And Adam, a lot of different angles to go here. First of all, let's just talk about this is an unusual matchup in that it is just the eighth true top 25 matchup in Keenan Stadium in the last 40 years. So it just hasn't happened very often. And, and Adam, uh, a studious youngster might be taking notes here Oh, for a five-second challenge later in the show. Okay. Three of the previous seven times that there's been a top 25 matchup in Keenan Stadium in the last 40 years occurred in the 2020 season. Mm. So fans weren't even there. Right. So uh, this just hasn't occurred very often in recent history. Adam, since the AP poll existed, came into existence in 1936, my research tells me this is only the 44th top 25, true top 25 matchup for Carolina football since 1936, regardless of location. So it, the Tar Heels, of course, want this to start happening much more frequently and not Shockingly, when Mac Brown's the head coach, it seems to happen a lot more than when he's not the head coach. But so, it's a big game. As I said earlier, it's two teams that I think legitimately can make the ACC championship. They're both good enough to play for an ACC title. You have the aspect of this game, and we'll talk about Miami kind of personnel in a second, but you have the aspect of this game of Miami coming off that embarrassment last weekend. And I do think, look, Miami would have been ready to play. They've It doesn't change the quality of player they have, which is high. Carolina has had Miami's number a little bit here recently. They're aware of that. So, I mean, they, they were going to be ready to play. But they've been just, they've been clowned at them in the national media all week for what Mario Cristobal has said. And I think anyone with any level of knowledge of football or even really math could understand that they made an egregious mistake last week in not kneeling at the end of the game against Georgia Tech when they could have just snapped it, kneeled, and won the game. Instead, they tried to keep running it. They fumbled. Georgia Tech then scores. And keep in mind, they didn't have to let Georgia Tech go score a touchdown, although I have to imagine the defense did not think it was going back on the field. That may have been a sudden change you weren't ready for. But, Adam, they've just been hammered over and over from any anybody who's got a podcast and wants to talk football. They, they talked about how wrong Miami was last week. So they've heard it. And you've got a talented team that's got something to galvanize around and it's tired of being made fun of. And so I, I think – Again, they were going to be ready to play. It doesn't change their personnel. But if there was any question as to whether or not they were going to be motivated and ready, that's out the window. I definitely think it makes it more difficult for Carolina to win the game. This type of intangible situation, there's absolutely no chance that there's one person coming from Coral Gables who's not completely blocked into this game and intent on proving everyone that the Miami you saw if you were up late last weekend is not the real Miami, and they're going to show you the real Miami if you'll just stay up late this weekend. So I, I don't think that outcome helped the Tar Heels, but it also, that outcome did somewhat reveal a little bit of who Miami is. So Miami's been very good this year, and I think they're very good. And they've got they've got one very good win, a home victory against Texas A&M. Now there are other games. I mean, it's been Miami of Ohio and Bethune Cookman and Temple, and this isn't the 2019 Military Bowl Temple, Adam. <laughs> let me tell you something. I mean, Miami has just steamrolled these teams, and the Texas A&M game was a 
relatively close game. Miami ended up winning by two scores. They scored very late. to me. It, it was a one-score game for pretty much the whole game, a competitive game. But again, they won. So a couple things about Miami. One, as is always the case, regardless of who the coach is or how good they are that year, they have athletes. They, they are going to have, from top to bottom, they will be one of, if not the most athletic, fast, skilled teams that Carolina plays all year. That's they. All they got to do is walk out their back door and yell, who wants to come play for the U? <laughs> and they get a bunch of really good players because they, they've just got incredible talent around them. I think that you also have to throw yeah, up throw the, the, yeah, the U-sign when you open the back door. Then yes. that's what does it. And so they, they have a high level of talent and athleticism and speed and skill, as they always do. Um, their defense has been very, very good. Texas A&M was able to move the ball against them. Really, nobody else has been able to move the ball against them. And they entered this game defensively, ninth in the country in total yards allowed, first in the nation in rushing yards allowed, 12th in the nation in scoring defense. So very impressive numbers. 268 yards, just 58 on the ground, 14 and a half points allowed per game so far. So really good numbers defensively. Um, they're active. They've got some older guys there. Some, I mean, some names that you probably just from being – a Tar Heel fan or an ACC fan, you know, it's Corey Couch and James Williams and some guys that you've seen play for them a lot over the last couple of years defensively. And then offensively, Adam, I mean, Tyler Van Dyke is still there. He has been very good this year until last game where he threw three interceptions against Georgia Tech. And that was a big reason, quite honestly, why Miami was even still close at the end of the game to eventually lose the game were the turnovers, and a lot of them coming from Van Dyke. I mean, Miami only had, he only had one interception all year before that game, then he threw three against Georgia Tech. Carolina has seen him be good in the past. He threw for 50, first of all, he threw 57 times, 57 against Carolina last year for 496 yards. So Carolina has seen him be good. And he's got some really good receivers. It's interesting. 73% of his completions have gone to three guys. Xavier Restrepo, who's very good in the slot. And then his two outside receivers, Colby Young, who's like 6'5", and Jacoby George, who's super fast. Those three receivers have taken a large majority of the receptions. But Adam, to me, what makes this Miami offense def- uh, different is they can really run it. That they can really run the ball. That they're averaging 211 yards per game on the ground. That's best in the league and top 15 in the country. They rotate two or three guys in that backfield to be the primary ball carriers. Mostly it's Henry Parrish and Ole Miss transfer and Donald Cheney Jr., who is the guy who fumbled at the end of the game last week. Mostly it's those two, but they'll rotate a few other players in in that backfield. And their offensive line is better. They and they have used the portal effectively. They've got an Alabama transfer and a uh, UCF transfer at center and at guard that have really helped shore up that offensive line. So it, it's hard to see a weakness on this Miami team personnel-wise particularly on the offensive side. I, I think they're very talented and, and athletic and dangerous. And I, I just think it's the best team Carolina's played. It's the most talented team Carolina's played. And Carolina's going to have to play well. And I'm going to let Adam talk in a second. The final part of this is, here's the great news, Adam. The Tar Heels have a team that are capable of taking this challenge on. I think there have been times in the past where you had big games and you thought, man, okay, this is a big game. Carolina's going to have to play extraordinarily well to win the game. And the Tar Heels have to play well, but they are capable of playing well enough to win this game and handling this challenge. It is a challenge, but this Tar Heel team is capable of taking it on. I think the other piece of good news is the game's in Chapel Hill. Yes. 
you've got a crowd that says they've been hungry to play games like this. Here it is. At this time of day, against this type of opponent, in this type of environment. This is your opportunity. Legitimately, you can make a difference in this game. And every slight difference may be the difference in this game. I think in general, when you think about Carolina football playing these types of games, when they have not gone the Tar Heels way, a lot of times I feel like I walk away going, Carolina got pushed around a little bit. There's something up front that the other team has that Carolina does not. And I think that's going to be really important tomorrow night. Miami's offensive line, as Jen said, has been really good. They've only allowed three sacks all year. They uh, they protect very well. I mean, and I think a big part of Van Dyke's success is because he has time to throw. If Carolina can get him on the move or get some people in his face, I think he he might make mistakes, as anyone might. But I I think a lot of his success is based on the fact that he's back there patting the ball and has all day to throw. Um, they've done a really good job in that regard. And Miami's defensive line. If Miami only put four players out there on defense, if you had only seen Miami play one time, you would say, well, they probably have four pretty good defensive linemen. Yeah, of course. <laughs> because yeah. they always do. Yeah. You're going to have to keep them off of Drake May because I think if you can, the end of the Georgia Tech game showed something that Miami has had some problems with which the Tar Heels are well acquainted with in their recent past, falling asleep a little bit in the secondary and giving up big plays. So if Drake May is not running around dodging big old guys and has time to throw it down the field, I think you've got a chance, although the Miami secondary is very talented and they talk a lot about their safeties, their safeties also will give up some some big plays. And we know Drake May is capable of and has the weapons to exploit that if given the time. Of course, Carolina's got to do the same thing defensively to Miami. If our good friend Elijah Huzzy, mm. hashtag power of the pod, three interceptions since he was on the pod. I assume he's going to spend a lot of time with Restrepo. If he can handle Restrepo, not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one, but without needing a ton of help, well, then all of a sudden you've got some different pieces to move around the board, put a little pressure on Van Dyke. All of a sudden he's turning the ball over. People are cheering. The new lights are going on and off. There's spotlights. There's jump men. There's interlocking NCs. It's a beautiful night in Keenan Stadium. They don't tear the goalpost down, of course, because they're very respectful. And also, Carolina's the higher-ranked team in this yeah, game. Not a goalpost game, regardless of outcome. But everyone hangs out in Keenan Stadium to celebrate the win. They light up the bell tower. Franklin Street's alive. <laughs> Boom. Make it so. I think the run game on both sides, and I know that's boring like football, but I do think it's important. I, I think the easiest way to keep those guys off Drake May is you're running the ball effectively, and they've been really hard to run the ball against. So that is going to be something to keep an eye on. And, Adam, I, I think you don't, the youngest part of the Tar Heel team is the cornerback position. And so you don't want Miami just being able to toss it up to Colby Young and Jacoby George against Carolina's young corners. And that's not to say that Marcus Allen and Tayon Holloway are not talented players. They, they are. But I think if Carolina doesn't want it get to the point that they can't get pressure or that Miami's running well enough that the play action's super effective and, and all of a sudden you're, you're hanging those guys out to dry that that's going to be a challenge because I mean Adam, you look at these two guys for the two main outside receivers I mean Colby Young is 6'5 215 pounds and Jacoby George isn't as tall he's six feet 176 but he can go and I mean it is just you you've got to make sure that you help those guys as much as you can I think I'm fascinated to see what Miami looks like in the first quarter I think we'll know a lot about Mario Cristobal as a coach in the first quarter. Because, and I I fully expect them to have smoke coming out their ears. Yeah. But I expect the Tar Heels to be that same exact way because, as we said, they've, they've looked forward to playing a game just like this. I also think, and you mentioned this, I think, on Tuesday's show, Noah Burnett kind of sneakily 
doing a pretty good job well, and feels like he could be important in this game. These have been tight games. Other than the football unicorn game of 2020 when Carolina played one of the most perfect football games I've ever seen. And now, granted, they are, I mean, that makes it sound like something lucky happened. The Tar Heels absolutely just crushed Miami in 2020. I mean, it was as physical a beating in a single game as I've ever seen the Tar Heels deliver to another high-level team. But other than that, in Mac Brown 2.0, 28-25, Carolina in 2019. That was Daz Newsom with the catch. And then people forget Miami also had to miss a field goal at the end. But 20, uh, 2019, three-point win. 2021, 45-42, Carolina in Keenan Stadium. And then last year, 27-24, Carolina down in South Beach. So that's three of the last four games. Tar Heels win all of them, and they're all decided by three points. Other than, excuse me, other than the one. So it was, uh, these have been, these have been tightly contested games that very easily could come down to a kick. Carolina 7-3 and three against Miami at Keenan. 15 and 11 overall against Miami, 7 and 3 in Chapel Hill. Do you think Carolina has outperformed maybe what they should have at Keenan? Or does Miami maybe get talked about a little more than what they are? I mean, the answer is probably both. But I don't think that's the case with this Miami team. I do. I mean, people who are of our age, the best age. Right. I mean, we know Miami as like the dominant Miami of the the late 80s and early 90s. I mean, they they were – and, I mean, and this is going to – they were like the tough talking in your face, you're a little scared to play them, that type of team. And they've tried to keep that energy with not as good a team for decades now. That isn't to say that they haven't had some good teams in there. I mean, they're teams of the – early 2000s were incredible. And so um, I think some of it is there's just always a lot of talk around Miami because some of their best teams are some of the very best teams in college football history and have kind of this aura around them of who they were. Um, They're kind of, they, they were what Colorado is right now in terms of personality. And and the way the media wants them to be in the story. Yes, I agree with Co- that. Colorado is not as good as Miami was. Then. No, 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 not nearly as good as as Miami was. And I'm not sure. I mean, I think also, and this is this is branching off from where we're going here. But I think also Miami was portrayed back then, fairly or unfairly, as kind of a little rough and tumble. Let's say on and off the field. Well, they did get off the plane wearing right. fatigues right. and gotten a like a brawl at the Cotton Bowl, right? And and they loved it. Like that's what made them good. And if you if you thrived in that type of environment, you went to Miami and they enabled you to reach the absolute peak of what you could be, right? And they've they've spent a couple decades now and a, several head coaches trying to recapture that, and it's it's just tough. Yeah. So, I guess my answer to your question is: I think Miami's always probably. They're going to be talked about whether they're eleven and one or five and seven. Um, some of that is, I mean, Carolina's also had. I mean, some of these wins in Keenan Stadium, Carolina's had good teams. I mean, Carolina was good last year. Carolina was good in um, twenty fifteen when they blew Miami out. They were decently good in twenty nineteen. Mac Brown's first year back, and that was, of course, right at the beginning of the year when all the magic was happening. Um, so some of that is circumstance. Well, and some of that includes Butch Davis, right? Who highly emphasized yes. beating Miami. Yes, and there's Connor Barth game. I mean, so there's 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 just some stuff there. Um, but for whatever reason, the Tar Heels have been able to be above average level of success against Miami. Like, and then, but it evens out, right? Like, I think Carolina's below average level of success against like Virginia Tech and Georgia, Georgia Tech, Tech, for Tech. example. Yeah where I, I would think Carolina would be more comparable to those teams than Miami. So, anyway, different discussion. Um, Adam, it's going to be a great day or a great night, a great weekend. You hope that that energy and excitement and buzz that surrounds the weekend, you hope it's paid off with a, a really quality performance from Carolina and a big win. You said it. Carolina fans, the Tar Heels, 
they've long wanted games like this, and they've got one. And it's 7.30, it's ABC, it's Saturday night, it's a good team. There's some legitimate things on the line, even though if you lose, you're not like done, but there's some legitimate things on the line, and this is what you play for. You get to sit around all day and watch the other teams play and look forward to your game, which we talked to Elijah Huzzy about how that was sometimes difficult if you're a player. Uh, But if you're a fan, you've got all day to get ready. You go to Keenan. You get there early because those new lights aren't just during the game, Jones. Oh, yeah. Tell us about the lights, Adam. Highly placed sources have told the Carolina Insider podcast, this is basically the real debut of the lights. 7.30 7.30 kickoff, but it won't kick off at 7.30. It'll be a little later, but be in your seat before that. Uh, you're going to see the lights do some stuff during player introductions, during the national anthem, when the team takes the field. So this, you'll see evidence of the, the money that was spent by a variety of people who were very invested in this um, to make this an awesome environment. And But you also see some stuff in-game, of course, going into the fourth quarter. That'll be really cool if it's a close game or if the Tar Heels are winning. Uh, that'll be a great atmosphere. Uh, so they'll do all, all sorts of cool things. You'll see different logos swooping around the field. Uh, lights will go on and off. It'll, just, it'll be a different environment than what you've experienced in Keenan Stadium before. Um, if you've been to a game at a venue that has these lights before, you kind of have an idea of what they're going to be. But if you haven't been then I think you're really going to be impressed and it will be a noticeable change that you will walk out of there going, I noticed those lights. Just the 10th time ever that Carolina has been 5-0. Ever. In 120 plus years. Yeah. 